Katie. Thanks Hi. for coming on today. Hello. Good to be here. How's it going? It's it's good. Just out in the lab right now in a conference room outside of lab and uh, getting stuff done. So it's been a good day. I'm having a bit of issues with my audio. How bad is this? One second, sorry. <laughs> Give me a second. I've got to uh, rework this. I don't know why you're not coming through my... Um, my headphones, so I'm just going to sort that out. It's not your end, I don't think. I think it's okay. mine. Let's turn this up. Alright, hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, there we go. Oh, I'm happy now. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you for coming on. We'll start again, obviously. Um, so for those that don't know who you are, uh, the floor is yours. Introduce yourself. All right. Well, I'm Katie O'Neill. I'm a cell biologist um, at the University of Colorado. I'm a PhD student, so not quite a real grown-up scientist yet, but working on it. And I'm here to talk about science and cancer and anything else. So um, let's jump straight into it. Obviously, you're a cell biologist. What does that entail? Like, what do you do? So. There are different kinds of cell biologists. I, I mainly focus on disease. Uh, my specialty is in cancer, so I study basically what makes a cancer cell different than a normal cell, and what uh, you know, how what is cancer? How can we treat it? Um, and how can we treat it without hurting your normal cells? So I really just look at how the cells work, look at their DNA and their proteins, and try to figure out what kind of makes them tick and makes them so bad for us. So why is um, sort of research into cancer biology like so important in the sense of the war on cancer and conquering cancer? Well, I you know there's there's the human aspect and then there's the science aspect. I think some scientists, myself included, I just really like science. I think it's cool to know how the world around us works and know how our bodies work. But obviously, um, cancer is a major health issue in the world. Um, a lot of people die of cancer, a lot of people die very young of cancer, um, and it's usually a pretty painful and traumatic way to see someone go, so I think there's a lot of people that are invested in it for that reason. Um, kind of off, I didn't send you this question, but it's just a random that comes to my head. Um, there's a lot of people out there that seem to believe that like the treatment for cancer in the sense of chemotherapy and stuff like that is actually what kills the person, not necessarily the cancer. Is that like? Is there any truth to that, or is it kind of just the uh, fake news, as people like to call it? <laughs> I, you know, I think there's some truth that chemotherapy is a very toxic drug. Um, it does make people very sick. It's really unpleasant, but it is the best way that we have that we know of right now to treat cancer. Um, so there are a lot of cancers where chemo is what is what's curing people. Um, definitely some cancers it's it works really well and other cancers it doesn't work as well but it, it is very toxic um, and that's because really the way chemotherapy works is that it kills cells that grow quickly because cancer grows really quickly so chemo is gonna hit those cells and make them die but at the same time you're gonna affect some of the cells in your body that grow quickly on their own so your hair cells and your stomach cells um, those are, are cells that need to divide a lot, they, they grow a lot, and when you get chemo, it's going to kill those, those cells as well. So it's really just a side effect. Um, and chemo, it, it, does, it does treat a lot of cancers very well, but no matter how well it treats the tumor, you are going to get sick from it. So um, part of why we have a job is that we're looking for things that are better than chemo. So you know, like obviously there's different uh, forms of cancer in the sense of like lung, stomach, and things like that. Do the does the cell, like the biology side of it, does it? Do the cells are they different, like on depending on the different cancers? Yeah, they're very different, which is part of why we haven't cured cancer, um, because we we say cancer as if it's one disease, but it's actually a, a name for about a hundred diseases, um, and all of those diseases are going to have to have their own treatment. So there, there are things that we're really good at treating, like um, Hodgkin's lymphoma as a, a blood cancer that we actually have a very high success rate. But we can't treat um, a breast cancer like we do 
a blood cancer, and then there's pancreatic, and there's lung, and those those cancers all are. Whenever you get a cancer, it's it came from your your body's cells. So if I get pancreatic cancer, it's because I had a pancreatic cell that turned into a cancer, and that cancer is going to be very different than you know a brain tumor. So so they are all very different. So, um, what do like antioxidants do to help prevent cancer? Well, so antioxidants have become kind of um, controversial because we've learned that um, they do they can help prevent cancer, but they can also once you have cancer, antioxidants can help cancers grow. Um, I think it was probably in the 1990s that scientists sort of discovered that we had these things called antioxidants and that they helped kind of prevent aging and helped uh, prevent diseases. And so everyone thought, oh, antioxidants are really great. Um, you know, let's all drink pomegranate juice and eat a lot of blueberries and we'll all be healthy and not get cancer. But it turns out that tumor cells actually have a lot of what is called reactive oxygen species. Um, and reactive oxygen species are what are sort of killed. They're not alive, so they're not killed. But we sort of consider antioxidants to be what fixes reactive oxygen species. Um, so as far as preventing cancer, when you have a lot of reactive oxygen species in your body, it causes a lot of stress. Your cells are very stressed out um, because reactive oxygen species, in a way, they sort of stick to your DNA. They're kind of sticky molecules that are floating around in your cells. They can bind your DNA and cause mutations in your DNA. So that's why they're bad. So the idea was that if we have these things that can get rid of the, the reactive oxygen species, then maybe we won't get cancer. Um, so they discovered all these different kinds of antioxidants, and everyone said, oh, this is you know how we're going to prevent cancer and you know all this disease. But it turns out that cancer cells are very stressed, and cancer cells have a lot of reactive oxygen species. Um, so actually, antioxidants can, can sort of keep tumors healthy as well. So it's antioxidants, unfortunately, have turned out to be something that was hyped up a lot and really is probably has no benefit to us as far as our health. <laughs> Strange. Um, so in the sense of like cancer in us, is it in everyone, is it in our genes and like our DNA and is it like what activates it or is it just something like, you know, someone smokes 20 a day and then just cancer happens? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's both. Um, so cancer develops because of mutations in DNA and you know, so we have all these cells in our body and they have to divide almost all of our cells are dividing all the time um, when they do that they have to replicate their DNA so a cell has one copy of its DNA and it needs to turn that into two copies of DNA and then split into two cells um, so when a cell replicates its DNA it has to copy it word, letter for letter, so DNA is, you know, this helix made of lots of letters, and when uh, when they replicate it, they have to do each letter exactly matched to the way it was originally, and that can actually be very difficult because DNA is very big, um, but there's a lot of sort of proof mechanisms in our cells that make sure that our DNA is copied properly. Um, but sometimes the proofreaders fail, so you'll get a mutation in your DNA. Um, and this, sometimes it does nothing, it doesn't matter, it doesn't do anything bad, but sometimes that mutation will make your cells start to behave differently. Um, and that can be cancer. Um, so it can happen totally on its own just because your cells are dividing and sometimes they mess up. Um, but things that we know that cause cancer like smoking or the sun, um, asbestos, whatever, those things cause cancer because they sort of, they put chemicals in your body that are really mutagenic is what we call it. So they're, you know, molecules that are likely to kind of stick to our DNA and, and make mutations. So obviously the more you smoke, the more you're going to accumulate these mutations that may your proofreaders won't find and won't fix, and that's going to increase the risk of cancer. So how do cancer cells like reproduce? Because yeah, obviously you said about like copying. Like, is mm -hmm. it do they, for example, say stomach cancer? 
is it just copying the stomach cancer cells or, and, or can it then lead into lung cancer and then and so on? Yeah, so it would start, so if you get a stomach, you know, if you get a cell in your stomach that has some sort of mutation that tells it that it wants to grow more, um, it will it'll start to divide, you know, it'll divide into two cells and those two will divide into four and those four into eight, you know, and so on. Um, and what has to happen is that the mutations have to be right that the cells no longer care kind of what's around them. So a healthy cell, you know, is going to be sitting kind of, if you think about like a tissue, like your, your skin on your arm, it's sitting in a nice kind of shape um, and it's structured very well. So all those cells are sitting next to each other. Sometimes they need to divide to make a new cell. Um, but they'll stop dividing if there's too many cells around them. They don't like that. They don't want to be super crowded. Um, so a normal cell has, we call it contact inhibition. And it just means that there's too much around me. I don't want to divide. There's, you know, there's too many people here. It's too crowded. Um, but a cancer cell doesn't care. A cancer cell will keep, you know, dividing and making more cells even when there's a lot of cells around it. Um, and so that's what a tumor is. A tumor is this clump of cells that is growing even though they shouldn't be growing. Um, and, and then you get what's metastasis. And metastasis is kind of what you hear, like, oh, she has metastatic cancer. Um, and that's usually what kills people. And that's when you know, that stomach tumor has found its way into the bloodstream and gone through the body to somewhere else and found a new home and made another, another type of cancer in another organ. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, I just, I just not a good nice. yeah. guy. Fucking oh, okay, no. Yeah, I wouldn't miss them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, how important is uh, diet in sort of reducing the risk of getting cancer? Um, because you know, I... no, go on. Yeah. Yeah, I I think that no one really knows exactly how important it is in part because we don't know exactly what about diet could be causing cancer or preventing it. Um, I think it's probably pretty safe to say that you know, eating a lot of junk food is bad for you and probably will increase your risk of cancer. And that might not be the food itself, it might also just be obesity. There's a lot of links between obesity and cancer um, and those have to do with all sorts of things. They have to do with you know, hormones and, uh, and how much fat cells you have um, and all sorts of different variables with obesity can sort of promote cancer. Um, as far as, you know, the foods that we eat and how they exactly might be causing or preventing cancer, I think anyone who says that they know for sure is probably full of it. Um, you know, there's a few things probably, you know, they've shown that when you are grilling meat and it has, you know, the, the delicious charred parts of it, um, that's been shown to be, you know, potentially can cause mutations in your DNA. Um, so there's little things like that, but I think overall it's really just, you know, if, if you're eating a diet that everyone sort of knows is kind of healthy, like not a lot of junk food, then you are probably have the same risk as the other guy who's eating generally healthy. It's mad, isn't it? So there's not like necessarily a uh, correlation between eating super healthy and eating super clean and having like loads of veg and fruit and you're less likely to get cancer whereas if you smashed I don't know packets of Doritos and chips and crisps and soda I mean I, obviously they're probably it's probably better for you in the long run to, to eat good but is there like a lot of science that says you know you're better off going this way there's a lot of a lot of people studying that. I mean, I think I do think yeah, if you're eating vegetables and you know and lean meats and uh, just generally a clean you know whole diet is is probably going to be is it will probably decrease your risk of cancer as compared to someone who's just sugar and you know garbage all the time. Um, but so so yeah, I do think diet is super important, and so is exercise and little things like that that we know are good for us. I do think those probably decrease our risk for cancer. Um, but it's more that when you get into like, oh, I have a really clean diet or someone who has a really clean diet that's a vegan or someone who has a really clean diet that's, you know, keto or whatever, um, 
once you really start getting into the super specific foods, I don't think there's a lot of science that's really conclusive. But yeah. but yeah, eating healthy probably helps. So um, what are like potential ways cancer can start in a person? So obviously I know you said like it's like a mutation, um, and that's usually how cancer starts. Is there any? Obviously, are there things that will put you at like a higher risk, like you said about the diet and things like that? Um, being exposed to asbestos, too much sun, I know those ones, but is there anything more sort of, um, how to explain it, you know, something that people don't necessarily know that may cause it, like, I don't know, computer gaming or something ridiculous? Right. Yeah, I, I hope not. I hope computers aren't going to give us all cancer. I guess it's probably too early for us to know. Um, but, yeah, I, I think actually one surprising thing is a lot of it's inflammation. Um, and are you, oh, you're frozen. Oh. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, now you're yeah, back. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we all, you know, inflammation is kind of a, a vague term, so a lot of scientists don't really use it a lot in, you know, in science as much because you have to be more specific. But as far as lifestyle things, um, things that cause inflammation are... An, an, an unhealthy diet, um, obesity, kind of an unhealthy lifestyle can sort of increase this inflammation in your body, um, whereas something like exercise will usually decrease it. And exercise can sort of boost your inflammation for a little bit, and then it'll bring it back down, um, and that's part of why it's healthy for you. And there's also have been a few interesting studies on um, athletes who use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, so that's ibuprofen, essentially, and acetaminophen, so Tylenol or aspirin or whatever, um, those sort of anti-inflammatory -inflam drugs, those have actually been shown to be, to have some effect on, on cancer and makes it less likely to get cancer. And it's not a huge effect, you know, it's not like if you're taking aspirin every day, you, you won't get cancer, but um, it does seem to decrease the risk of cancer. So. So that kind of thing, you know, exercise and taking those ibuprofens can actually have a difference. So in the sense of obviously your cells in your body, what um, what does like sleep deprivation do? So say you're someone who doesn't get their eight hours, how bad is yeah. that mess of your cells and or even cancer as a whole? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think anyone really knows um, how sleep deprivation could be involved in cancer, but it probably is. But it, it's more a question of um, of why. So, you know, if you're if you go to sleep every night without staring at a phone, you know, there's all these this research right now about circadian rhythm, where when we're staring at our phones until 11 p.m., we're probably messing with our circadian rhythm um, because you know humans and all animals evolved to go to sleep once the sun goes down. Um, so light affects our circadian rhythm. When there's no light, it sort of triggers this in our brain that it's time to go to sleep. Um, and the, the chemical that's sort of involved in that is melatonin. So you'll hear that some people, if they have trouble falling asleep at night, they'll take melatonin pills. Um, and that just sort of helps your brain know that it's time to sleep. So there's some studies that suggest that, you know, if you're just staying up too late and you're, you're not sleeping well, it's you're getting this imbalance of melatonin, and that that could be causing cancer. Um, but then there's also things like if you are someone who doesn't sleep a lot, maybe you're stressed, and maybe that's causing cancer. You know, or maybe you have a job where you have to work at night, and that job is in construction where you're exposed to more chemicals. So there, I, I think that there is almost definitely a connection between cancer and sleep, but I don't think we know why. So obviously um, there's a lot of theories out there involving cannabis in, in the treatment of cancer. Um, what's your sort of take on it in the sense of kind of seeing maybe things that not people who look on YouTube or whatever see? Yeah, well so first I think a lot of things are taken a little bit too much to an extreme. So you'll hear, you know, marijuana cures cancer. and pharmaceuticals don't want you to know about that. Um, marijuana definitely doesn't cure cancer, uh, unfortunately, but it's true that there are some, you know, there are a number of sort of active 
chemicals in marijuana that are now being looked at. Um, so, you know, we, we most often think of THC, which is the compound in marijuana that gets people high. Um, and people aren't really interested in that as, um, as, a, yeah, as a potential, you know, medicine. They're not really interested in THC as medicine because it'll get people way too high before it kills a cancer cell. Um, but there are all of the non-psychoactive you know, compounds in marijuana that people are looking into. Um, and there's actually a fair amount of research on whether or not they can be used. Um, I think a lot of the papers, so when I've read about this in the past, you know, there will be some website that says, there are 20 studies that prove that, uh, that you know, cancer can be cured by marijuana. And it will list these studies that everyone will say, oh, that looks scientific, that sounds great, yeah, that's, you know, there is the cure and the science is out there. But if you actually look at those studies, a lot of them just tested in a dish or in a mouse and they tested at really high doses, you know, where it would be like you got to be putting out stuff in your vein all day long. Um, so I think, I think that there are some potential medicinal qualities of those compounds for cancer. I, I definitely believe in um, cannabis and cannabinoids as like pain for pain management and nausea management, I think. Um, I mean, I live in Colorado, so we have legalized weed here. Um, yeah. You can go pick it up at the store if you want. Um, and I, I believe in it as far as pain, and, and definitely I know people who have gone through cancer treatment and use it for the, you know, to ease the, the misery of chemo. Um, I don't think there's a ton of evidence that, that the compounds in marijuana will kill tumor cells, but I think it's possible, and I think, too, that um, if we can figure out, you know, there, there are studies that show that, you know, as cells in a dish, if you give them cannabinoids, those tumor cells will die. So if we can figure out why that's happening and maybe make something that would be a stronger medication based on that knowledge, I think it's really useful. Um, but I don't think that smoking weed will, will help your cancer, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things because um, I'm part of, or when I was on Facebook, I was part of the a group and it had like um, 16,000 people on it and they were all kind of people that were using cannabis to try and cure their cancer and um, it's literally just come to my brain now um, I was thinking yeah that's cool like because they are actually like they are seeing benefits they are going to the doctors and things are happening um, but also then you read that they're like eating loads of fruit and veg now and they've quit smoking and they're exercising and blah 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 so it's like all these different variables that are potentially actually helping them to get better yeah absolutely and and also a you know anecdotes which you know your friend telling you like oh i i ate this and i cured my cancer is sometimes you know that's not that's not really science. That's somebody's opinion, it's, especially once you've started, you know, making that lifestyle change. You're a little bit biased, I think, towards towards your own successes. So it'd be interesting if that kind of lifestyle change can really um, have an effect. But I think most of the actual like scientific clinical studies that have a big sample set and say, okay, you guys eat the fruits and vegetables, and you guys eat junk food, and we'll see whose cancer goes away. Um, most of those studies have not found that there's a really big difference. So if there is some magic secret, we, we don't know it yet. Well, fingers crossed we, we eventually find it, you know. Um, so do you think someone with like a, a high um, acidity pH level has like, we've, we've probably addressed this already, but um, there was a guy called, because I watched an interesting documentary about cancer and there's a guy called like Richard Hoagley or something Richard Ho Hoagley I think he got um, defrauded in America anyways in the end but he was saying um, that cancer can't function in like a high alkaline body so as in like if your pH level is like really high in alkaline it can't function that will cure your cancer or stop you from yeah. getting cancer um, is there like a lot of science behind that at all or so uh, there's there's yes and no. So there, there's no studies looking at you know like an alkaline diet on cancer, and the reason for that is that it's known 
that it doesn't matter what you eat, your body's pH is going to stay the same. So your body exists around a pH of 7.4, which is kind of in the middle. It's a little more on the on the basic side. So you've got you know your basic uh, pH, and you've got your acidic pH. So an alkaline diet would be kind of where you're eating a lot of basic foods. Um, but your your body exists at about pH of 7.35 to about 7.45, and if you go above that, you're going to be very sick, and if you go below that, you're going to be very sick. So when I eat a food, it goes into my stomach, and my stomach is full of acid. Um, I think the pH of a stomach is about 2 or 3 um, on the scale, and this is a scale of 1 to, I think it's 14, although I should know that. That's like elementary school science, but I don't ever think about those far ends of the spectrums because nothing that I do exists on those two ends of the spectrums. Yeah. Um, in the lab, everything is at a neutral 7.4. Um, but So when you eat a food, it goes into your stomach. Your stomach is super acidic, and pretty much anything that go any pH that you put in your stomach doesn't really matter because your stomach acid is going to just wipe it out, and then your stomach's going to release all of those, you know, nutrients and carbs and whatever into the blood, but your blood um, really has to stay the same, the same pH, or else you you will end up in an ER and <laughs> be very sick. Um, so it's it's true that tumors um, are usually pretty acidic, and they're in their little, you know, so tumors exist in this little like pocket of their own. They sort of are protected from the rest of the body, and and that does that little we call it the tumor microenvironment. Um, and that space does get very acidic, but it's next to impossible to change the pH of, of the microenvironment just by eating, um, by doing really anything, because you would probably die first. <laughs> yeah, sorry everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so what are your um, theories on like uh, human evolution? Uh, like well, your, it's, it's Your studies it's real. and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No. I. I mean. I've always been pretty interested in just how um, humans have come to be. Um, I think it's pretty fascinating that we're alive and able to sort of change the world around us to an extent that no other species have. Um, so yeah. I, I. That's kind of one of my like for fun reading. I definitely don't do any research on on human evolution. But it is it is cool that we have evolved and have such control kind of over over our fates and our health. And stuff like that. So the theory of uh, it was Darwin, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the that's the one. All the yeah, theory, he's mumbo jumbo. Yeah, no, yeah, he's um, he, you know, I forget when that book when he wrote The Origin of Species, which was his big book about um, evolution, but. It's crazy because that he really didn't have any technology. It was a long time ago, and a lot of people didn't believe him. But it's wild because I had to read that book in a class in university, and um, he was right about a lot of stuff. <laughs> and it's pretty impressive that now science has gotten so far. We know so much more than he did, but he was he was right about the most the majority of his of his ideas. So that's pretty cool. So if you couldn't uh, focus on my like, cancer. What would you be focusing on in the sense of any other diseases, like Ebola or something like that? Yeah, well, so the the way I got into uh, to science was Ebola. Um, in the 90s, there was a big Ebola outbreak, and um, my mom liked to. There was this book called The Hot Zone that my mom read, and it was all about the Ebola outbreak. And Ebola is this horrible uh, disease where you just bleed internally and sometimes externally, so like through your eyeballs and you know, all of your, under your fingernails, any cut, any cut you have just starts bleeding. It's really gross. Um, but I remember hearing these stories and thinking it was so crazy that, you know, our bodies work so well so much of the time and then you get this little tiny virus in there and it's just, you're going to bleed out of your eyeballs. Um, so I, I definitely have some interest in disease. Um, I think disease is cool, and, and how things go so wrong in our bodies is, is kind of my main interest. Um, but there's also some cool 
research out there right now on aging. Um, aging is kind of a hot topic. You know, why do we age and what can be done about it? Um, should we do anything about it? That's kind of a cool, a cool area of science right now. Yeah, because I've been watching um, a podcast uh, you might be interested in if you're not already. It's by uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick. Okay. Uh, and um, she's quite interesting. She talks about um, like broccoli sprouts and the chemical in broccoli sprouts and how that's like used for reducing aging and in mice and sleep and stuff like that. She's like really intelligent. She's been on the um, Joe Rogan podcast like three times and people okay. always uh, crack jokes in the comments. They're like, ah, oh, best get my book out and start taking notes because obviously she's um, got a master's in like chemistry and uh, how food and that. So yeah, it might be something up your street if you're, you're yeah, interested in all should- that stuff. It's, it's unfortunate. There are a few, there have been a few things that people have discovered that they think, oh, this, you know, this causes aging. Um, so let's try to stop it. And actually what's interesting is that when you try to stop things that cause aging, a lot of times you end up causing cancer. Um, and similarly, sometimes when we try to stop cancer, we end up causing aging. And this has all been done in mice. This is very kind of, you know, we don't know how this works in humans really, but um, there does seem to be some sort of opposing force, which maybe makes sense because cancer wants to grow and survive and aging is sort of, well, when things stop growing and stop surviving. Um, so yeah, that's it's a new field of science, I think, uh, will be a kind of hot topic for the next 10, 15 years. Why See if we can we, keep... Why do we use mice as like the what we do things on and then we go oh, it should work in in humans now i never understood it is it to do with dna yeah. or something it's not a it's not a perfect model definitely i think probably a better model would be monkeys um <laughs> but yeah the reason we use mice is honestly it's practical it's because they have short lives and they're cheap to maintain um so, you know, when I'm doing something, so the way that science kind of gets done is first we do it in a dish. So I have cell lines that, you know, I have, so I said, right now I work on breast cancer. So I have a few uh, breast cancer cell lines and those at some point were inside a woman and she said, hey, you can take my tumor and use it for science. Um, and now we just grow that tumor and we can grow it forever and ever in a dish in the lab. Um, and that's, so that's how we do a lot of the early work, so we're figuring out how are these cells working, what do they do, what can we potentially try to stop so that cancer stops growing. Um, so maybe we'll find a drug that we're like, oh hey, this doesn't kill normal cells, but it kills our cancer cells. So let's see if this would work in a living thing, because things when they're in this little dish full of, you know, lots of sugar, we keep it in this liquid full of sugar and nutrients. Um, but we need to know what happens when it's in a living thing. Um, and so the, so what in cancer what we do is we put those cells into mice and then we can see sort of do they does the cell line form a, a cancer in mice? Does it give the, the mice cancer? And then if so, can we give the mouse a drug, you know, a medicine and see if it'll prevent the tumor from growing? Um, and we do that because we can't just put a drug into a human because a lot of drugs, are super toxic and we would give it to a human and they would pretty much die immediately. Um, so we just need to have something in between kind of the cell lines that we learn about, you know, and then and then humans. And it's just become mice because they are are easy to deal with as part of it. <laughs> but they are very different than humans. Um, we always joke that we've cured cancer in mice a million times, but once you actually move into humans, it's not always so easy. So, um, do you think there's any, like, sort of man-made diseases out there that are, like, used and kept or anything like that that could potentially start a war or something? I don't know. I hope not. You know, I, I, I'm, I always really like, like, the apocalypse kind of stuff. Um, I read all those books, and I think it's definitely possible. I don't know if it's been done. I'm sure that, you know, I guess if it had been done, they wouldn't want it to be well known. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's possible. And it's, you know, that's a scary thing. Biological warfare it hasn't really happened. You know, we have a, we've seen chemical warfare, but we haven't really seen biological warfare. 
Um, so who knows? I wouldn't be surprised if someday it happens, but I don't. I don't know if anyone's accomplished it yet. So hopefully, hopefully no one's working in a lab right, right on that right now. Um, Russia is just like gonna uh, gonna drop Ebola on a bunch of fucking people and that's yeah. it. We're done, you know. Yeah, no, that would be great. I mean, that's kind of how the, the United States was invaded, right? They, the, the Spaniards came and brought smallpox with them and killed off most of the people. So it's happened in the past, um, probably not intentionally, but I think, yeah, that could happen. It's scary. <laughs> it would be like um, Planet of the Apes, you know? Yep, yep. Then the monkeys just take over. <laughs> yeah, it would, yeah, it would kind of, I wouldn't mind, you know, that it makes for a good a good movie, but I also, I get sick all the time, I think I'd be one of the first to die if there's, if that happens. So, uh, zombies I think I could handle, but disease, probably not. Probably not, yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's, uh, that's me sort of out of questions. Is there anything you'd like to add at all? I think that's about it on my side. Cool. Well, um, the floor is yours for two minutes if you want to advertise where people can find you if they want to contact you about featuring on podcast or anything like that. Um, feel free yeah. to advertise yourself. Yeah, well, you can find, so it's my middle name. There's a million Katie O'Neills in the world. Um, so I use my middle name a little bit. So uh, my Instagram is Katie Irena. So that's K-A-T-I-E-I-R-E-N-A. Um, and then you can find my science Twitter at K I O'Neill. So that's O N E I L L P H D. And I'm just sort of getting my social media presence started, so I'm looking forward to to what's next. Ooh. I'll put the links down in the um, in the description below anyway, so they'll be able to find you and contact you if anyone tunes in or wants to uh, reach out for you on a podcast. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. Like it's, yeah. it's been an interesting chat. Um, I've learned a bit, um, and I'll Good. get to you off camera anyways. Which, uh, if you're okay, just for two minutes, just a little recap, see how you felt it went, and all of that. Um, but yeah, yeah, thank you for coming on. Great, thanks, guys.